Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure today to introduce uh, my new colleague, uh, Pleiser. So Christina has been acting as uh, head of the labor market department in Leiser for one year or so, I would say. And, and before that, she acted uh, a long time ago as a researcher in Stanford University. I would say in the wake of your PhD there, a PhD that you, you did under the guidance of uh, Nobel Prizes, James Ekman and Gary Becker. Then you moved to Mannheim University and finally to Heidelberg, where you acted as a full prof there between 2011 and 2020. So the research interests of Christina are in labor economics, returns to skills, digitalization, policy evaluation, and migration economics. And Christina published uh, on these uh, different topics in uh, excellent journals like JEA, AJ Applied, uh, Economic Journal, Journal of Labor Economics, and so on. I would say that with regard to the contribution of Christina to migration economics, she published very influential papers on the effect of citizenship rights on economic and social integration of immigrants. And I guess that today's presentation is in line with the previous works that you did in, the, in that field and deal with this time the impact uh, of access to citizenship on children's school performance. So the floor is yours and you have 45 minutes, but it's flexible depending on the questions that you have uh, during the presentation. Great. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for being here. Thanks to Fred for the nice uh, introduction. So yes, this is in the line of research of studying citizenship and its effect. And I should say this is joint work with three former or current uh, doctoral students. Two of them are also here. So, you know, this is a migration crowd, so I don't have to uh, tell you much, but I find the figures just amazing. If you look at the share of young people who have a migration background and you look at European countries, Luxembourg, um, our new home, is, you know, right up there with like the two thirds basically of the of the young people having a migration background, but you even see it in you know countries which you wouldn't think of as immigration countries: Switzerland, Belgium, Germany, and you know Sweden, Austria. I mean, all of these are countries which had at least a third of their young people um, with migration background of various kinds. So this is per se, of course, not a problem. The problem comes a bit because as of course also many of you know that there are sometimes um, immigrants have weak outcomes in, in many of these countries. So we know from the adults that they often have lower employment rates and lower wages. There seems to be at least a perceived lack of social and cultural assimilation or integration. And what's going to be important for today is there seem to be also native um, migrant gaps in educational achievement. And in some countries, even the second and third generation are doing worse than the first generation on some dimensions. So obviously this poses a problem because it is associated with missed opportunities for the immigrants, but also potentially high fiscal and you know, other costs to the destination countries. And of course, it has social implications because it has potential negative effects for social cohesion and could have all kinds of nice bad side effects. So the question I have been asking myself for quite some time is, can we do better? And if so, how? And of course, there, there are multiple ways you can think about how to improve achievement of immigrant children. Um, you can, you know, be brutal and say, well, we have to make sure we select the right immigrants and we try to deter the, the wrong ones. You can think about education policies, you know, do we need better early education? Do we need less tracking in school? What are kind of support system that could work? The policy I want to think about today is, is more uh, about citizenship. Um, so this idea that if the host, the host country bestows a right and gives the immigrant a right to be a full member of society with all rights and responsibilities, with all expectations also, can that make a difference? And so there are basically three types um, of research questions. Um, the one, the first one is straightforward. So does citizenship actually make a difference in terms of educational achievement for immigrant children? And then I think the more, maybe even more dominant question in this talk will be, well, who actually benefits from citizenship? Is it all? Is it a certain subgroup? 
and which policies for citizenship actually work. Um, and I will tell you a little bit more about this because we have a quite unique setting where we have different policies working on different margins, which will help us to better understand what potentially can make a difference. So you might ask, well, why should citizenship even matter? So I think there are three types of arguments that why citizenship should actually matter for, for immigrants and, and in particular their investment in education and, and performance in education. The first one, which I broadly call economic incentives. So there is a lot of, well, there's some evidence, uh, part of it uh, I've worked on, that we do have benefits in the labor market as citizenship. This in part is because you have access rights to all jobs, which you might not have, especially as a non-EU citizen, uh, yeah, immigrant. There is, of course, free mobility. You can go wherever you want. You can take any job you want, which is not always true if you're, you know, if you have a certain um, type of uh, visa. And also, of course, your employer might be less willing to invest in you if he thinks or if she thinks that you might not stay and, you know, maybe it's a wasted um, investment. And we do have pretty strong evidence that in Germany, for, for sure, access to citizenship improved labor market outcomes, in particular for immigrant women. The second argument I would make is, I think there is also, which is maybe more a sociological argument, I think there is also something like norms of the host country or the, the, the set of social values maybe that, that's also um, prevalent in the, in the host country. So if you think that, well, citizenship also comes with certain role model or a certain expectation, um, what you should achieve, whether you should work, whether you should um, be successful, that could also be um, a role model that um, immigrants take over when they, they become citizenship. In economics, we have learned about this through this influential work of oppositional identity. So the idea that, you know, maybe I do, don't want to be associated with the majority culture and that might create actually barriers to my um, success. So that could be a second type of argument. And of course, there is a third argument which says, well, maybe immigrants also face overt or maybe hidden discrimination that natives don't feel like they're, you know, a full member of society and hence might, you know, give them worse grades in the school context or do other things. What's pretty amazing is, is that in my prior work, we, as I mentioned, we, we see this effect in the labor market um, pretty strongly. We see it even more strongly when we look at what I call social integration in terms of marriage and family behavior. So there is clear evidence that women in particular change their marriage and childbearing behavior in response to access to citizenship. And so I think there is a lot of arguments why this might also change upbringing, role models, and the um, educational style. And of course, you know, the discrimination argument could also feed in. Um, there is at least anecdotal evidence that in Germany, as an immigrant child, you were less likely to be sent to high school rather than the lower tracks. There is less um, systematic evidence, but, you know, that could also speak to an argument that maybe discrimination matters. So in terms of our contribution, so we do want to study the effect of citizenship on educational outcomes. And I think one of um, the key innovation that we will um, do is that we will use an econometric framework that allows us to actually analyze heterogeneous effects of citizenship to really get at the point of like who benefits from this. And we can also say a bit more about actually which policies work. Um, and hence, I think we are, we are distinct to the mostly reduced form literature that tries to um, estimate a reduced form intention to treat effect um, and doesn't really look into heterogeneity of these effects. There is, of course, our framework, which we will use as the marginal treatment effects literature. There's a very active and actually very much a growing literature on, you know, studying all kinds of things, returns to education, welfare, disability programs. There seem to be papers coming out every, you know, every month, basically. But nobody has really looked at this for immigration and uh, citizenship policies. So I think we make um, a contribution here. 
And then, of course, um, I think more broadly, we are also, of course, um, contributing to the very large literature on assimilation and intergenerational mobility, because we are looking at one particular policy and ask, well, does that actually help getting immigrants, moving immigrants forward in achieving better results? So I've talked a lot about citizenship policy, so I should tell you a little bit more about, well, what is this even about? So basically our analysis, which we have also used in, in other work, is based on two very big reforms that Germany undertook in the last 30 years. So you have to think about a country that prior to 1990 really didn't have a naturalization policy because all of the citizenship was basically based on blood. So if you had a family relation, yes, you could become a citizen if you're and great, 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 and you had a chance. But if you immigrated from Turkey and you didn't have German ancestry, it was almost impossible. That changed in 1991. And um, um, if you like, I can, I can talk a little bit more about why. But basically, the key is that for the first time in 1991, they introduced actually criteria how you could naturalize. And these criteria are listed here. They started off with pretty severe residency requirements for adults. These were 15 years, which is, you know, if you think about, for example, the US, it's only five years, so it's a very long time, but it varied a bit depending on age. So it was shorter for younger people and typically longer for older people. You couldn't have a criminal record, so some sm small things were okay, but typically, you know, severe crimes, of course, were excluded. You do have to show some economic self-sufficiency, so you could basically um, pay for your own uh, living, and you had to have a very, very basic um, education. These conditions are basically the same you need to fulfill for the permanent residency requirement, so this is not really a big issue. I think a big barrier or big thing was that you had to renounce your previous citizenship. Um, and you had to declare some loyalty to the German basic law, the constitution, basically. In 2000, the second big reform came. And what they did there is to basically reduce um, the residency requirement for everybody to eight years. So they became more liberal for naturalization, but it's still longer than, for example, in the US. And the key thing is that they introduced birthright citizenship. So if you were born in Germany on January 1st, 2000 or later, and, and that's important, your parent had to be a legal resident in Germany for eight years at least, you became a citizenship by birth. Now, what makes these two reforms really interesting, which I want to show you, is that we basically get two very different policies how you could give citizenship to people. The first one, this is the yellow block, and don't worry about all the details, is that if you were either a first or a second generation immigrant, you could naturalize under specific rules, which depended on the time and, and when you came to Germany. But that's sort of this yellow block of, well, you can choose through naturalization to become a German citizen. The second road or pathway to citizenship is the blue block, which is basically giving you automatic citizenship by birth if you satisfy certain criteria. Now you can imagine these two different pathways actually are quite different, right? One is by birth, so it's very early and you don't select into it, it's basically automatic. The second one, the yellow one is you do select into it, so you might have very different people choosing that policy, but you naturalize obviously not at age zero, you, you typically naturalize much later. So what we will try and do um, in this project is you know, to estimate the joint effect of these reforms, but the ultimate goal um, also wants, uh, should be or is, is planned to be to separate actually which of these policies work better, what, which are showing the bigger benefits. So how are we going to do this? So let me talk quickly about the data and then I have to torture you with a bit of econometrics so you can see how things are implemented and then I wanna walk you through the results. So what we're going to use is a pretty new big data set on education and educational achievement in Germany. For the longest time, we didn't have any good data really on education in Germany. So this was a major achievement that they started that panel. And we're using WAVES from 2010 
to 2018. And it's pretty much an annual survey of the children or youth in school and the parents by phone and not every wave. This data set is really nice because it has relatively large number of immigrant children. It does have information on school performance. So we have grades, what kind of grade you get in German and math, which are kind of the key subjects, whether you repeat a grade and also which track you're in. So lower track is sort of finishing after nine or 10 years or whether you go to high school and finish after 12 or 13. And then um, we also have standardized tests, which is really a revolution in Germany. So we have uh, tests on language and math. And what's also really important for us, we have the background information from the parents about the migration year, citizenship, and region of origin. So we can actually see which family is when eligible for citizenship through one of these pathways I explained to you just a second ago. So what we're going to do is to choose a sample of first or second generation immigrants. So either you're born in Germany or you're born abroad, but you came to Germany at some age. Your parents have to be foreign born, um, obviously, otherwise you're not an immigrant. And you're basically coming to Germany somewhere between age zero and 16. And the nice thing about uh, this educational panel is that we observe different cohorts so we can actually cover the whole career from pre-K, so basically age four or five, all the way to the end of secondary schooling, grade 12, which is really nice. So we can really look at throughout the school career, well, what's happening actually if you um, obtain citizenship. If you look at the sample, just to give you an idea of what the, the data look like. So we basically have pretty high take up of citizenship. So 84% of our sample has actually German citizenship. This is, by the way, much higher than the typical aggregate um, naturalization statistics we get, which are somewhere around 40%. So we do get a lot of children actually having citizenship. Then you see that a lot of these children are eligible through their parents because their parents can naturalize. And if they naturalize, they can put you as a child, dependent child in the application. And then we have the children through the individual eligibility, they can apply them themselves for naturalization if they're age 16. And we have people who are eligible through birthright citizenship because, as I mentioned, they are born after January 1st, 2000, and their parents have been in Germany long enough. As I mentioned, we have these outcomes and I think important to mention here is when you look at the grades I mean, in Germany, they go from one to six and less is better. So if you have a one, you're great. If you're a six, you're basically failing. The test scores are normalized uh, across age groups and also to have mean um, zero and standard deviation of one in the first sample. So the negative mean basically means that our group of immigrants are below by about a third of a standard deviation, the average which already tells you that they're worse than children from German natives. Just to give you some more sense about, okay, what's going on here with the kids? So we have about 15% of the children are born outside of Germany. They are roughly in teenager age when we have them on average. The parents have been in Germany for you know, a variety of uh, years, for roughly 20 years when we see them, and they're about 40 years old. If you look at the distribution across countries, we basically are going to look at five broad groups, the traditional EU countries, Turkey, which is a very big sending country, which is a fifth of the sample, former Soviet Union, which is also a big group, or roughly also a fifth, and then Central and Eastern Europe, which is a massively growing population in Germany, which is as big as the Turkish community now and the rest of the world, where we basically bunch everything together from Asia, Australia, and America. Tina, can I just ask you a quick question? It's a little bit back. So with the citizenship, if I think I remember the reforms correctly, so with birthright citizenship, the kids, when they turn 18 or whatever age, they have to make a decision then whether to keep the German one or renounce the other one that they're eligible for. Is that that's yes. correct? If That's you just, true. There used to be this option, the option period where at age 18 or a little bit later, you had to decide 
he abolished that um, basically a couple of years ago. So now you can keep both. Okay. And for the first generation, if I'm like 16 and I just, and I qualify because I've been in the country eight years and I apply, I also have these kind of decisions to make or no, I really, no. Um, I mean, in, well, so according to- I had to, to decide whether to give it up, the other one. Yeah. So in principle, 1991 reform told you, you have to give it up. Basically, since the 2000 reform, officially you do, but almost half of the people now keep two. I think they just don't ask anymore. From what I know, okay. it's like the U.S. It's becoming default, like the U.S. policy. Um, is, don't well, ask, don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> it's, it's sort of, exactly. Okay. No, and the other question was with this former Soviet Union. Are you ruling out people with German, like uh, German ethnic background, people who got automatic citizenship, or they're they're in that pile also? Um, that's a good a good question. Um, we can't. I think we try to rule them out, but um, I know, it's so easy. <laughs> it, it's, we, I mean, whether we catch all of them, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know, Christina, if you have uh, any any thoughts on that, but uh, maybe we can also postpone that. Um, yeah, no, it, it's not a super important question. I was just surprised how big the group was before the Soviet Union. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, we did get um, a lot of people from the former Soviet Union. I mean, the Soviet Union was also huge, so um, you have plenty of uh, <laughs> feeding, uh, feeding. Region. Okay. Sorry, sorry, Christina. Can, yeah. can you talk a little? Can you go back a little bit to this point about the eighty something percent in your survey and forty percent in other data that had acquired citizenship? Why do you have this big difference, and do we have to worry about it? So when I talk about the forty percent, that's basically the take up in all of the population across all age groups. And you would think that citizenship, you know, if there are any benefits in terms of, you know, um, labor market outcome or educational returns, then of course, the younger you are, the more likely you want to you want to take it. Um, so, you know, if you're 80, what the hell? I mean, it doesn't make really a difference. So I would say, you know, the point that we have this high share of um, take up is basically due to age. Unfortunately, there's no aggregate statistic by age group uh, who takes up citizenship, at least not for the period since 2000. So it's hard to tell, um, you know, whether that's a sample issue, but there's clear evidence that um, older people have a much lower likelihood of picking up citizenship. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's venture a little bit into the, the econometric framework to make sure that we all uh, understand what's going on. And I will try to keep it short and as painless as possible. So basically what we want to do is we want to see, uh, in order to study the heterogeneous effects of citizenship, we do want to see the whether observable and unobservable gains to citizenship, um, how they correlate with take up. So, you know, other way to say that is we have a typical endogeneity problem. People choose citizenship or at least have certain uh, demographic or characteristics that make them eligible for citizenship or make them um, um, yeah, choose citizenship. And we want to see whether the people who actually pick up citizenship are also the ones that benefit from that in terms of our um, educational performance. Now, what we're going to use is the multiple treatment effect um, framework because it really allows us to uh, learn who's benefiting and who's not from citizenship. And the way we're going to use that is we're going to use the eligibility, the pathways to naturalization, the, the two big blocks, individual eligibility and family eligibility and birthright eligibility, on the other hand, to instrument for actual citizenship. And then study what happens in school in terms of great repeating a class and so on. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to use a pretty standard um, potential outcomes framework where our outcome is weighted combination, whether we are treated or not treated. So I hope, yeah, I'm sure you have all seen that. We take a very standard um, approach where we have the outcomes depend on some observables, for example, country of origin and UJ, which is the unobservable game, which is what we are interested in. So if we combine these two, we get this classical selection bias problem that you have observable gains, which is this n times x beta 1 minus beta 0. So this is how people, let's say, of different country of origins benefit from citizenship. 
for example, non-EU citizenship should benefit more because they gain more rights to the citizenship than EU citizens. And then you have on the right, the last term is the unobservable gains. So somehow people who are naturalizing might have higher gains and that's why they select into citizenship. Now we model this take up decision, which is the, the N. So whether you naturalize or not, as again, a pretty standard latent um, function. So it's a function of observables X, so like your characteristics and the instrument Z. And then we have an error term as usual, and you have this latent index where you naturalize if your latent N star is greater than zero. We make a key conditionally dependence assumption, which you all know from IV regressions or IV um, approaches that the instrument conditional on X have to be independent of the outcomes. That's key. I will go get back to that, but that's the typical assumption we make in, in IV regressions. Um, now it's becoming important. What we can do using result um, derived by Wittlersill some time ago is that we can sort of transform this problem into one where we don't use V, but we use U of N, which is what we call the unobserved cost or unobserved barrier to actually take up. Whenever this unobserved barrier is larger than my observable propensity score, which is the P, X, or Z, then I'm not going to take up citizenship. That's just the way we are going to model it. So when I will talk about UN, it's always higher UN means I somehow have these unobservable barriers that make me not take up citizenship. This is going to be key for our econometric um, approach. Now, again, I, I guess most of you have seen this. So what I can now do is instead of estimating just a regression model and estimating some average um, IV estimate or some late, I can define this fundamental marginal treatment effect from which I can derive all the um, conventional treatment effects. And I basically condition this on a particular X and on a particular cost or unobserved barrier. And this is just the average gain of the people of citizenship with a certain X and a certain unobservable U. So if I observed U, U of N, I could easily sort of calculate that, right? So if I then plug in our functional form assumptions, we just made a couple of slides ago, what I basically gain, and this is the key object of interest, I can see the, the marginal treatment effect has one component, which is the observable gains, which varies with observable characteristics. And the second term is the selection bias, which we always call. So what are the unobservable gains of people of a particular U of N? And so the way you can interpret this marginal treatment effect is that it's the gain in whatever outcome you observe, let's say test scores, for the group of people who are just indifferent between take up and not take. Why? Because I'm conditioning on a particular U of Let me quickly illustrate. So how does this work? So the dashed line, basically you see here in this graph, um, this, this curve is the expected outcome. So test score, let's say, for our group conditional on our propensity. So the probability that you pick up citizenship. Now let's focus on this on the first vertical point on the left hand um, on the on the side. Basically, what you see is this particular propensity score. So this probability that you pick up citizenship P of Z. Let's say it's 0.4. At this point, I have two groups of people. I have people to the left who are have a U of N that's smaller than P of Z, and they are picking up citizenship. And I have all the people to the right who have a U of N greater than the probability, um, their propensity score, and they don't pick up citizenship. So this point, this black dot on the left, is exactly the gain for people who are just in this sort of little interval where their U of N is almost equal to P. And you can do the same for um, a different P of Z. So we can take the right point and do the same calculation and then by choosing basically the line between these two points, we get the slope of the marginal treatment effect. So we get sort of what's the, the benefit in terms of test scores 
for people who are just indifferent between selecting into treatment or not. And then we can sort of aggregate that into our conventional treatment effects like average treated or the treated, for example. So that's the, basically the idea. So how are we going to do this in practice? And this is actually relatively simple. First stage, we're going to estimate a take-up decision. So we're going to um, estimate, a, let's say, a probit model of the probability that you're naturalized on our instruments and a set of access, our control variables. Our instruments, as I mentioned, are whether you're eligible for either birthright through the individual application or through family eligibility. And then we have a number of controls to make sure that we are not picking up some spurious correlation. Um, so we are controlling for birthplace, we are controlling for year of birth dummies, we are calling, controlling for age, arrival age and gender, and we are also controlling for parental characteristics, year since migration, and region of origin are the most important ones. And then, of course, we're also controlling for some regional and time fixed effects. Based on this first stage, we can calculate what's your predicted probability of picking up citizenship given the access and disease. So that's my propensity score. What's my, you know, given on my characteristics, what would be the likelihood that I actually are picking up citizenship? Then I have to impose common support in the sense that I have to, you know, often people that actually naturalize have very high propensity scores. People that don't naturalize have very low propensity scores because obviously the axes predict um, and disease predict to some extent the actual take up. So I have to make sure because I do want to compare people who are treated and not treated that I observe both, P, uh, both treated and non-treated on with the same P. So I have to cut off people where I only observe treated or untreated people. And this is how I do it. I just impose common support which is a typical assumption you use also in matching, for example. Now I'm going to use in the second stage my calculated or my predicted propensity score to estimate the second stage, which is basically the mean outcome or the difference in outcomes estimated on my observable axis and a function of this propensity score, which will pick up how the gains in terms of, let's say, test scores varies with the unobservables, which I will proxy with this propensity score. Now, for example, and this will generate my um, MTE function, which basically gives me the gain along observables and unobservables for each point, for each X, and for each P. And then I can basically look at the distribution of MTEs and then calculate um, aggregate treatment effects from that. And the way this is to be implemented is by either using a local IV, so a localized version of an IV regression. I can also use alternative approaches. And in our case, it doesn't really make um, that much difference because you both get very similar results. Okay, maybe I should skip in, for time reasons, I, I skip um, some of the discussion, but I can yeah, come back of um, potential problems with the identification strategy. So let's look at some results. So here's the, the first stage. So this is basically saying who is going to pick up citizenship. And I, I just use two different samples. One is the full sample and one is the main outcome I will focus now, which is the sample where we have information whether they ever repeated the grade. The results are pretty similar. So it's easier, you can focus on one. So what you see here is that basically all our eligibility indicators have a strong positive effect on picking up citizenship, which is what we would hope for. So birthright citizenship has a strong positive effect. Parental eligibility has a strong positive effect. Individual eligibility has a strong positive effect if you're foreign born. And the main reason is that individual eligibility is the main channel how people who are too old to satisfy the birthright citizenship requirements actually naturalize. So we don't see it for German borns that they apply because most of them already got um, eligible through birthright citizenship, but it's the main channel for foreign borns. Interestingly, we, for example, we don't see gender differences, but we do see that, and that's I think pretty clear out of the policies we see, if you're foreign born, you're much less likely to be naturalized because you won't have access to the birthright citizenship. 
if you look at the region of origins, I think the pattern is also quite interesting. So relative to the rest of the world, EU countries are less likely to naturalize, which I think makes sense because they basically have the same access to the same rights um, as, as Germans, at least in terms of, for example, labor market rights. However, the two groups that are very strongly selecting into German citizenship is people from Central and Eastern Europe, so Poland, former Yugoslavia, and all the people from former Soviet Union, you see it much less likely for the Turkish. Interesting. This is our predicted propensity score, which you see that for the treated, we have a big group that has a pretty high propensity score, which is what would be expect. For the non-treated, you see that they're relatively well yeah, distributed. But what you also observe is that we can't really say much for the people who are at the very left, who are very, have very low um, um, of uh, these predicted probabilities. So we will mostly focus on this section of the propensity score that is between these red dashed lines. Stina, just really quickly, in case yeah. I missed it, do you throw out people who are just not eligible? I mean, clearly there are, I mean, if you're not eligible, you can't get citizenship in a sense. I assume that's, or is that just everybody below 0.4? essentially also you're not throwing i mean so if you're not eligible you might become eligible at some point right okay but there's some clearly if you if you're early in your sample you came after 2000 and you've only been in the country two years you're not going to be eligible for a very long point yes. for example no, that's, that's true. <laughs> that that is true yeah i was also wondering just i think it's something we've talked about before the I think it would be interesting instead of looking at the countries of origin to maybe also have something about the double citizenship rights from the countries they come from. Because I suspect, I mean, that's always been a big talk about with the Turkish, you know, is this because of their not feeling integrated to Germany or is this because they have to give up Turkish citizenship and how important that is? I don't know if you have enough variation across the other countries. Yeah, I think not in this sample, but I think it's, it's something we can answer at some point because of this other change I told you um, I was mm -hmm. mentioning before. Yeah. Okay, so let's, um, now I've tortured you with all this MTE stuff. Now let's have actually a look at how the MTE looks like. So this is again for the probability that you repeated the grade throughout um, your schooling career at some point. And what you see here is that for people that have relatively low unobserved resistance, so these are more people who are selecting into citizenship on the left-hand side, the gains are basically zero. But what you see is that for students that are having very high unobserved costs, for them, actually, we would see a sub could potentially see a substantial reduction in the likelihood of repeating the grade. So this basically means that on the right-hand side, we have more people that are not selecting into treatment because they have unobserved barriers. This actually means that for educational outcomes at this lower end of repeating a grade, it would actually be good if these people selected into treatment, because then we would um, actually observe them to be less likely to repeat a grade. Now, we can also do this, aggregate this um, MTE and calculate what typically are more conventional treatment effects. Um, and I did this here for a variety of different outcomes. So the first one is our grade retention, then whether you're going to high school, your German grade, reading um, test score, math grade, and math test score. What you see for most outcomes is a similar pattern. We see that, let's focus on the ATT, which is basically the people who select into treatment, what's the average effect? So the people who are the children who are naturalized, we see that they do benefit on average for that they are less likely to repeat a grade. And they do seem to, at least in terms of the, the math grade, for example, they seem to be doing a little bit better we don't see that much on the test scores, for example. What's surprising the pattern is that actually the benefits for those who have very high barriers and are not treated are actually even higher. So this would imply that the benefits of citizenship are actually higher for those that don't show up in as German citizens. So somehow with this policy, we're not yet capturing all of the children that would benefit from citizenship in terms of um, improving their, their schooling outcomes. 
which is a bit surprising because we basically get a reverse selection on gains that the children that would benefit the most are not the ones that actually naturalize or are eligible for naturalization. If we ask ourselves, so how is that possible? Um, how is it possible that the children that seem to have very high gains actually are not naturalized or are not picking up citizenship? So one argument could be, well, they, they just don't know or they don't act on these gains, or they don't know about the gains, maybe because they're not very much educated or because they just have not good information. What you see here is that, and these are unconditional um, um, graphs, and um, I, we still need to change them. You see here, basically we plot on the left-hand side, the number of books in the family against our unobserved cost. And on the right-hand side, we check whether the share of families where the mother has um, um, higher education, more than primary school. And what you basically see that um, for children with very high unobserved costs, so more on the right side of both graphs, you do see that the untreated have lower levels, but it's not necessarily true that families with high unobserved costs have, are sort of have fewer books or where the women are worse educated than um, for uh, children where the unobserved costs are low. So this is suggestive, I think, that it's not really that these people don't pick up citizenship because they don't have information or they're just ignorant. I think another potential explanation could be, well, maybe they don't select into this um, treatment, they don't pick up citizenship because they feel not really German, or they don't want to feel, or they're not German, and they feel more attached to their home country. And here we, we try to do the same exercise of saying, well, can we, can we find some proxy that tells us a little bit about whether, you know, they might feel attached to the home country. So here I, we, we have basic information, whether they speak German at home, or whether they feel as a foreigner in Germany. And what you see here is, that it looks like, um, if you focus on the right-hand side, for example, is that for families with high costs, these are high unobserved costs, more of the untreated feel foreign in Germany than um, we see for families with low costs. So somehow this seems to be less about information and maybe more about some kind of identity thing that is the reason why these families don't pick up their citizenship for their kids. This is still tentative because that's something we're still, um, we're still working on. We do all kinds of robustness checks to see whether our results are basically um, stable. So I you know, could go on for a long time, which I won't, about what changes. But most of the time, uh, the results are amazingly robust. Um, whatever the specification, the controls, the, the functional forms we use. So I will... Um, I will skip that. Now, given that we find the result that the people with the highest gains are actually seem to be the ones that we don't capture with the policies that we have, we run some policy simulation. I just want to spend a minute on, on quickly explaining what, what we do. So we basically do two kinds of policy simulation. The first one is somehow imagine we had a magic tool to increase take up. And we do that uh, by basically assigning a higher propensity score to our sample. And what we see is if we do that and we estimate um, the, what they're calling the policy relevant treatment effect. So the people who switch if because of our um, perturbation of the propensity score, the likelihood of great retention would actually be re reduced substantially. So that means if we could somehow increase take up, we would get better outcomes for these students at the lower end is that they're less likely to repeat the grade. The second simulation we did is to say, let's impose a sort of US style birthright citizenship. Let's drop the requirement that people who are born in Germany, with, that the parents also have to be in Germany for eight years. And let's give birthright citizenship to everybody who's ever born in Germany. If we do that, we actually find also that the results improve. The effects are slightly smaller, but they're quite similar to the, the policy simulation in A. So 
that's something we are still exploring. But what it looks like is that expanding the eligibility to citizenship even further could actually have positive effects for the children. So let me conclude. So basically, what we, what we can show at this point is that liberalization of citizenship in Germany do, does have benefits for immigrant children. It's especially at the lower end of the maybe grade distribution, so they're less likely to repeat a grade, which of course is mostly the bad students. There are some small improvements in grades. We see little on test scores, which also is interesting. We see, as I mentioned, this reverse selection in terms of unobservables, that those with the highest gains are actually the ones that don't seem to be picking up citizenship. But we do see very strong positive selection in terms of observables, in particular country of origin. And it seems like, and I find that also quite surprising, that the biggest benefits of citizenship really are for Eastern Europeans and people from the former Soviet Union, the Turkish have very selected and modest results, which I find interesting, maybe also depressing. We also showed that we can expand the eligibility and that would have additional benefits, so maybe that's something to consider. What we are still working on is to try and separate the two pathways. I mentioned birthright versus naturalization and see whether actually one or the other has bigger effects in terms of school outcomes. And here I will stop and thank you very much and looking forward to a discussion. Thank you very much, Christina. So we have 10 minutes for the discussion now. So who has a, a question? Uh, Madeleine, I think, to start with. Sure. That was terrific. Thank you very much, Christina. I'm wondering if you were able to look at within family variation, and in particular, maybe when you start to compare birthright versus naturalization, whether there's the cost barrier means that some families naturalize some children, but not all. And if so, whether they're sort of making the correct choice um, as to which ones to naturalize in terms of benefits. Um you know, nice idea, but impossible to do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, I mean, we uh, well, very, yeah, we don't have that many families where we have multiple children. And of course, for example, if you are applying as a family, it would be very odd if you include one kid and not the other. I mean, if you apply for citizenship, why would you exclude your child, um, one child, but not the other? So I think we will have, yeah, we just don't have enough um, Variation, unfortunately. Someone else? I, I have my minor question that is related to, to measurement errors. So I've been exchanging with the other Christina during your presentation. So uh, if I understand correctly, for children that are, let's say, teenagers, they are self-reporting the information. And I was wondering whether children that are born in Germany just think that they are German, independent of whether they have actually got the citizenship or not. So whether there's any sense that this might be the case. So a lot of, I don't know, Italians in Germany that just tell you we are Germans, even though they have not been granted citizenship. I, that might be true for the Italians. It's definitely not true for the Turkish. <laughs> so, I mean, you do have this, um, you know, the oppositional identity. You, you do have this phenomena that um, for a variety of reasons, you get people to kind of, you know, do be less likely like the host country, you know, I think, you know, um, the veiling, um, I mean, the headscarf, I mean, all of these are things are, I think, also, you know, signs of, um, in part, at least, also um, distancing themselves from the majority cultures. So I think just living in Germany per se is it's not changing. Uh, it's not changing much. I mean, I would actually be more worried about the opposite side. Whether, suppose I'm Turkish, I become a German citizen, but then my teacher still thinks of me as Turkish because maybe I look Turkish or maybe I do wear a headscarf or for some other reasons. So the question for me is whether actually the any kind of discrimination or lower expectation in the sense of well, you know, she's not going to do well anyway, um, whether that is actually attached to citizenship. Now, I mean, we do have some evidence that it's mostly the school performance and less actually the skills that change, which makes me wonder whether maybe it is 
on the teacher side um, that they are somehow changing their perception. But that's, you know, that's a hypothesis. I'm, I don't really yet know um, how to substantiate, but the fact that we don't see much in test scores makes me somehow wonder whether it's really more on the teacher um, assessment um, that, that they get benefits. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for, for the presentation. It was really, really interesting. I was wondering, coming back on what you were saying on the probably the effect is on teachers' perception of uh, the children, whether, in a sense, children changing the nationality, obtaining the, the German nationality uh, at some point, does that, I mean, the teacher does not get that information per se, right? So how, how, do, you, how do you think about the results on, on teachers' perception? So, I mean, uh, there are, of course, children that... Um, literally switch citizenship in our sample. But a lot of them, I mean, especially the birthright citizenship ones, they will come with the German citizenship already. And then, mm -hmm. of course, what we will, what we basically compare is people who are coming with citizenship rights and are naturalized to those that, you know, whether the parents are not long enough in Germany or something, um, and they are not eligible. So a lot of this will be not a within-person comparison. So in that sense, um, I mean, I agree, you know, the, the teacher might not know whether I naturalized last year, but if I enter throughout my career um, as a school kid, I mean, there is information in the school, what's your citizenship and what's your, um, what's your background. I was wondering whether it's, it could be a story of parents investing differently and then sending to different types of school or, you, you know, that would be more of the parent knowing that my child is now naturalized and now I want to invest more in centers. Yeah, so there, there is some evidence on that from, from some other studies. So we know that their parents do invest more. We also know that, so this, this track choice is an interesting one because in many um, states, the teacher makes a recommendation, but the parents can then choose and they can overrule basically the teacher recommendation. And what we seem mm -hmm. to see is that there is an effect on what teachers recommend. But there is an, maybe an even bigger effect that parents from immigrants, parents are more likely to overrule. And so, and most, mostly in the, in the sense of their, the teacher says, ah, you know, you should go to the lower track. I don't really see you in, in high school. And the parent then say, hmm, okay, but I will send my kid to high school anyway, which a lot of German uh, native parents actually do. And so the immigrants seem to be becoming more courageous in that sense of saying, well, what the teacher says, you know, I know better. Maybe aspirations by, by parents. Maybe aspirations have changed, yeah. Or maybe this idea of, well, what the teacher says is an opinion, but it's not law, basically. That could be, yeah. C'est cool. Uh, yes, thanks a lot. Thanks for Christina for the nice presentation, very inspiring. So um, my question is a bit um, maybe beyond the paper, it's more general. So I'm wondering whether the effect of citizenship could be could um, change over time and be affected by the treatment itself. And my idea is that um, if citizenship is a rare good, uh, then uh, a liberalization might actually reduce the effect of citizenship and uh, um, it's based on the, what you mentioned in the introduction about this, the, the social status maybe that could be attached to citizenship and what you hear regularly um, from mostly from people opposed to immigration is that, okay, if citizenship is so easy to get, then it doesn't mean a lot anymore. And I'm just wondering whether you could um, say something about that based on your analysis. I guess yeah. I mean, you have so, um, you don't have a time varying if treatment, so it would be difficult. yeah. So I think this paper will probably not be very informative, but um, I can draw on some other evidence we have on um, uh, on for adults. So basically, what you're describing is to say. Well, you know, citizenship is like a crown, like the best immigrants, we basically give them this crown of, of having a uh, German passport um, versus citizenship as a catalyst in the sense that it changes the aspirations, the motivations and investments of the immigrants. 
I think the first one, you might think, well, if I give it out, if I give the crown to everybody, there's no king anymore, right? Because they all have crowns. But if the, so I think that describes what, what you're saying, that maybe it becomes worthless. If it's really about motivation, aspiration, and investment, I would think that this is less of an issue. So what we have in our other paper, what we can basically show is that I think the catalyst um, definition is more important because what we see is that people's expectation of when they become uh, eligible for citizenship is really driving their behavior. So what we do is we basically um, exploit surprises through the reform. So immigrants have a certain horizon. Oh, I have to wait 15 years for citizenship eligibility. And then all of a sudden, the 2000 reform gives them immediate citizenship because they already have been in the country for eight years. So we use that um, basically difference in the time expectation versus the actual residency requirement they have to fulfill. And we basically show that people who think they have to wait 15 years but can naturalize after eight behave very differently from people that expect they have to wait eight years and actually them are eligible after eight which tells me that this time horizon this is really driving the, the effects in terms of investments and, and marriage behavior and, and childbearing. So I think, I mean, that's, I think, evidence in, in the sense that it's a catalyst. And that, I think, makes me believe that um, I don't think changing the eligibility in terms of being more liberal will reduce and make maybe citizenship worthless as a signal. Thank you very much. So if there is no burning question, it's 6.30 already, 6.31. So no burning question. Then I have to thank Christina for the great presentation and say goodbye and announce that next week we will have uh, Paola Giuliano from UCLA and Simone will chair the session, uh, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, correct. Okay, so thank you very much, all of you, and see you next week. Bye. <laughs> thank you, take care.